The last several years has brought about some serious changes in camera image tech. Large sensor video cameras, 720p, 1080p, 4K, better and more affordable optics, and more. One industry that hasn't really caught up are webcams. Webcams are still fairly terrible cameras. Drivers are often old with controls that look like they're from Windows 98. The settings can be reset between different applications. They have some serious trouble dealing with exposure, and because they're designed to be used close up, they don't look all that flattering. So what's the solution? Ditch webcams. Hi, I'm Dave Bodie for Tuts Plus, and in this course, I will show you how to set up a system using a consumer video camera and a capture device to get the best live streaming video quality possible. You will learn about a capture device that works for Windows, Mac, and Linux. You're also going to learn about how to set up the camera and lighting to make you look your best. In fact, I'm going to show you how to set up this exact lighting rig that I'm using right now. And you won't just be learning about how to get a great looking picture. You're also going to learn about how to get great sound too. I'm also going to give you some specific cost-effective recommendations on gear that I know works. At the end of this course, you will know how to create a super high quality video streaming rig of your very own. Not only will this work for live streaming services like YouTube Live, Ustream, Google Hangouts On Air, and others, but it will also work for just about any video conferencing app out there like Skype, Google Hangouts, and more. Make sure to check out the next lesson where you're gonna learn about what gear you need to be able to follow along and set up your own video streaming rig. In this lesson, you will learn what you need to follow along and create your own video streaming rig. So when you think about upgrading your video streaming presentation skills, you have basically two sides. You have the video side and you have the audio side. Probably the most important thing, if you're going to do anything, is to upgrade the audio because you can have great looking picture, perfectly in focus, great lighting, good dynamic range, spot on color, but if the audio is all garbled, it doesn't really matter what the picture looks like because the messaging is not going to get across. If you flip that and your audio is really high quality but your video not so great, maybe not perfectly in focus, that doesn't matter so much because the messaging is still going to get across and that is the most important thing. So we are going to be looking at how you can upgrade the audio side of things and we're gonna be talking about getting a microphone. So you're going to need some kind of better microphone, some kind of upgrade over the built-in microphones that you may have on your laptop or that your computer may have come with. Even if you have kind of a multiple microphone array, that's still not very good when you compare that to a nice lavalier like I'm wearing here, or a nice handheld mic if you get it nice and close, or even a shotgun microphone. All of those are going to be vast improvements over what you have now. You're also going to need some way to get the audio from the microphone into the computer with as little noise as possible. Now, in some instances, depending on the particular camera and the microphone, you might be able to get away with piping the audio into the camera. In most cases, that's not gonna work because the microphone input and the preamp system on the cameras we're gonna be looking at is just not good enough. So you're going to need a dedicated system for getting that audio into the computer in a very low noise, high quality way. So you're going to need some kind of USB audio interface and we're gonna be taking a look at those coming up later. The next thing to look at is the video side of the equation. So we're gonna be looking at cameras. You're going to need a camera and don't worry, we're gonna be talking about how you can use a very cost effective consumer grade camera to get you going and get very high quality picture. You're also going to need to get this video signal into the computer. So you're going to need some kind of capture device. And we're gonna be taking a look at those in an upcoming lesson as well. Now, to make everything look really great, we're gonna to have to address the lighting. So we're gonna be taking a look at some different lighting solutions and how to light things to make you look really great because the quality of the lighting is directly proportional to the quality of the video. Bad lighting, even with a great camera, still looks bad, but great lighting, even with a pretty inexpensive camera, looks great. So we're gonna be taking a look at how to light and what kind of options you need for lighting as well. 
You're also going to need something to set your camera on to make it nice and stable and position it. So we're gonna be talking about some camera support as well. Now, you're also going to need a computer to make all of this work. And I'm sure you probably knew that, but it's worth mentioning that you're going to need a reasonably fast machine with either USB 3.0 or Thunderbolt to get the video in in a very high quality way. The solution we're gonna look at in this course is going to be USB 3.0. So if you wanna follow along exactly, you need a computer that can do USB 3.0, but those are very common these days, so that shouldn't be a problem. So now that you have an idea of the general pieces and parts that you're going to need to make this work, it's time to talk about cameras, and that's coming up next. When it comes to cameras, you have a ton of options, but do you need to go with a high-end, very expensive video camera, or can you get by with something a little bit more basic? In this lesson, you're gonna find out exactly what to look for in a camera system. So right away, I can tell you that you do not need a high-end video camera for really good results. A consumer video camera is going to be far better than any web camera, and here's why. Consumer video cameras have a much larger sensor compared to a web camera. Now, this is important because the sensor is the main thing that's responsible for the picture quality. And when it comes down to it, a larger sensor in almost all cases is going to be better than a smaller sensor because given the same number of pixels, a larger sensor is going to be able to gather more light, or in other words, more photons are going to be able to hit that sensor. That's gonna make it more sensitive to light. And so compared to a smaller sensor, a larger sensor will not have to turn up the volume on the picture to properly expose the image. Now, when a camera has to turn up that volume or turn up the gain, it gets noisy. So a larger sensor is not going to have to turn it up as much and therefore the picture is going to be better because you're not gonna have that crazy noise that you get with almost all web cameras. The lens on a camera also makes a really big difference. Now, when you're looking at web cameras, most of them have fixed lenses. Some of them can do autofocus, some of them can't. But even with a little tiny lens, even if it has some nice elements in there, it's still not gonna be nearly as good as a basic consumer level camera for one reason. A consumer level camera is going to be able to zoom or use a higher focal length. This is a big deal because almost all web cameras are wide angle because they have to get a lot in at a very close distance. So you get this wide angle look and a wide angle camera tends to distort the picture, meaning that things that are closer look kind of disproportionately larger than the things that are further back. And so you can get kind of this distorted image in a web camera. Now, it's not as bad as something like a fisheye lens, but even with a basic consumer level camera with a zoom lens, you're going to be able to zoom the picture in and use a more narrow field of view. What that's gonna do is two things. First, when you have a more narrow field of view and you can back the camera up, you're essentially going to make you look the same compared to a web camera because you back the camera up and then you zoom it in and so you are going to be the same size compared to a web camera that's very close and very wide in the field of view. The main benefit to this is that with a zoom lens or a higher focal length lens, you're going to see a lot less of the background, which means you don't have to light the background as much, you don't have to worry about what's going on back there. That's a benefit. The other thing is that when you use a higher focal length lens, it makes you look better. So moving the camera back farther and using a higher focal length or a narrower field of view is going to make your features look better. They're gonna look more normal. And if you get the camera back far enough, you're gonna actually look better than you do in real life because it's gonna make your nose look smaller and your face kind of look more compressed and you're generally going to look a lot better on camera and that's a good thing. So bigger sensor, better lens, these are all great things. Dynamic range is another thing that's going to be a good bit better on even a basic consumer camera compared to a webcam. Now, dynamic range is the camera's ability to capture extremes in brightness, very, very bright things and very, very dark things. And you're thinking, well, that's not really super important because I'm not gonna be broadcasting outside and so I don't need to capture the sun and super dark shadows. But here's the thing, webcams are so bad that even things that are not very bright sometimes get clipped 
into being fully white. A lot of times this is very problematic when it comes to reflections on the face. So little tiny light reflections that normally in real life you wouldn't see on a web camera, they tend to look really bright and shiny and it makes you look sweaty and bad. That's not really great. So even with a basic consumer level camera, it's going to handle those highlights and those shadows better and that's gonna make you look better. You're not gonna look greasy and sweaty, which is generally not really a great thing. Another major benefit to a consumer video camera is color accuracy and white balance. So getting the color of skin to look like the color of skin is going to be pretty important because you don't want to look green or blue or even more orange. You want to look like you. And these kind of cameras do a much better job than almost all web cameras. White balance is another area where a consumer level video camera does a lot better job. So depending on the type of color of the light, these type of cameras are going to do a much better job managing and kind of picking where white should be, which is going to make all the rest of the colors fall into place. A lot of times, even if you have some manual setting on your webcam, I know from personal experience that I can't get the white balance to look right. Even if I set it to the exact color temperature of the lights that I'm using, it still just doesn't look right. So color is another very important thing and these type of cameras do a much better job. So now that you know why these are better, let's talk about what to look for in a camera. And like I mentioned earlier, you do not need a very expensive camera for great results. The main thing that you need to make this work is a camera that has a clean HDMI output. Clean HDMI output is a very clean looking picture with no on-screen displays, so no minutes remaining, no exposure settings or values or meters, no audio meters, just the picture. It also means that it needs to be just the picture without any weird kind of resolution reformatting. So if you're shooting in 1080, you want a 1080 picture over the HDMI without any weird kind of scaling or resizing of the picture. You're also going to need a usable frame rate of video to come over that HDMI cable, something like 30p, 24p, 60i, or 60p. Most of the time, if you have a clean HDMI output, all of those other things are going to be no problem. You're gonna have the right frame rate in the right format without any weird kind of resizing or rescaling of the picture, and it's gonna look great. Now, one of the reasons why it does look great is because you're getting the signal before it goes through any kind of encoding or reprocessing for recording on the camera. So when the image is captured by the sensor, it does some initial processing, which you can't really get around, then the HDMI tap kind of goes out and then after there it goes through some more kind of encoding and processing where more information and resolution is kind of chucked out the window and then it gets recorded. So we're actually getting a better signal out of HDMI than you can record on the camera, which is really fantastic. And that means even with a consumer level fairly inexpensive camera, you can get really, really great quality. In addition to having a clean HDMI output, you're going to want some more settings for your camera to get the best results. The two main areas are manual exposure, and if you're going to use audio, manual audio. So on the exposure side, some cameras are going to let you set the aperture, the white balance, the shutter speed, and the camera's gain or ISO, or basically the sensor's sensitivity, all manually. And then some cameras that have a manual exposure are much more limited, but still kind of manual. So for example, I set up a camera for a client of mine and that had kind of full manual controls where I could set the aperture and the shutter speed and the camera's gain and the white balance. This camera is basically kind of touch exposure and then it sets the exposure and then you can kind of push it up or down by a few stops, which is still kind of manual exposure because the most important thing that you're looking for is to get the exposure right so things are as bright as they need to be and they're not too bright and they're not too dark because the aperture and the shutter speed are not as important. The aperture is going to be whatever the aperture is and because these are pretty small sensors, you're not going to be dealing with kind of a large amount of depth of field. That's not really something you're going to need to worry about. And the shutter speed is almost always going to be set appropriately, especially if you're using enough light, which in this course, I'm gonna show you exactly how to do. If you're going to try and use the camera's audio system to bring in audio with the HDMI, you definitely need manual control over that microphone input. You're also going to need a microphone input because 
if you're going to try and use the onboard microphone on the camera, then it doesn't really matter because that's not gonna sound great. So you need a microphone input and manual control over that microphone input. So when you're looking at cameras, you don't really need to spend much more than two to maybe $300 at the high end, and that's for a brand new camera. But the great news is that camera technology from today looks almost identical to camera technology from about five years ago, because despite what the media and the marketing will tell you, the sensor technology has not changed a whole lot in that time period. Sure, there are slight increases to quality maybe every year, but it's very, very minimal. I mean, a camera from eight or 10 years ago, sure, that's gonna look a lot worse, but from five years ago or four years ago, it's probably gonna look almost identical. In fact, the camera that I'm going to use for this course is not a new camera, it's a couple of years old, and it looks almost identical to a camera that I bought brand new this year and I set up for a client. They're almost identical in image quality, so you can definitely get a great looking camera and you don't have to spend a ton of money. Now that you know what to look for in a camera, it's time to talk about tripods, and that's coming up next. So as we're talking about cameras, I also wanna mention tripods because you're going to have to put this camera on something and that means a tripod. Now you may be tempted to buy a tripod from your local big box electronics store or your discount department store, but do me a favor and just don't. Those tripods are not going to work out very well. What I recommend is getting a tripod like this. This is a photo tripod and you're thinking, yeah, but I'm using a video camera, but just stay with me here for a second. These type of tripods are really good because they offer a lot of flexibility in your setup. You may be restricted in space, so you need to get the tripod fairly close, and so these type of tripods have these articulating legs that you can get to be very flat, and of course, they change in length, so you can get them very, very short, and so you can put them very low, or you can get them very close to things and kind of put the legs up on a table, and so they're very flexible in that way. Now something that's gonna be fairly important to look for in a tripod is getting a tripod that's going to be high enough for your particular application. Ideally, you wanna have the camera or the lens right about at your eye line, maybe a little bit up. Just like it's very popular for people to take selfies kind of up like this, you wanna have the camera higher than your face because it makes your face look a little bit better when you have your chin up a little bit as opposed to having it back here where you get this kind of action right here. So getting a tripod that can get the camera at the right height is going to be pretty critical. But that doesn't mean you have to spend a ton of money. In fact, Amazon has a nice tripod that's kind of a photo tripod like this. It doesn't have the exact same kind of ball head system. It uses a pistol grip ball head, so it's a little bit of a different mechanism. But they have a tripod that's about $65 shipped on Prime that goes up to 70 inches. And so if you add another few inches for the lens, that's gonna work for probably most people unless you are a super tall individual. If you are a super tall individual, you're probably gonna to have to spend a little bit more, perhaps as much as $200 to get a really tall set of tripod legs, or sometimes referred to as sticks, and then a tripod head. And I found a nice set of legs made by Benbo that goes up to 101 inches, and I'm fairly certain that almost none of you are going to be that tall, especially when you add a head on top of that, that's gonna add another three or four inches and then your camera. So you're gonna be looking at a maximum height of maybe around 105 or 106 inches. And I'm going to hazard a guess that that's definitely going to be high enough for anyone watching this course. So it's important to get a tripod that is going to be sturdy and most importantly, get the camera up to a height that's going to be appropriate for the type of presentation that you wanna do. You're gonna learn exactly how to set up the camera and position it to make you look your best in an upcoming lesson. But for now, it's time to talk about how to get the camera's signal into your computer. And that's coming up next. The next part of this process is to get the video from the camera into your computer. And in this lesson, you're gonna learn what video capture devices are going to work best. Several months ago, I was working for a client and he asked me to set up a really nice looking video streaming system for him. So I was looking around at all the various ways I could get video into the computer in a very stable way and one that would work on a lot of different systems in case he was on the road and he had a different laptop or a different system. 
What I first started looking at was the Black Magic Design products. I've always been a fan of their products. I think they make really great stuff. And there was one product that looked like it was going to work very well called the Black Magic Design Intensity Shuttle. Now there's two variations of this product. There's a USB 3.0 and there's a Thunderbolt version. Now my client at the time was not interested in getting a Mac, so I was looking at the USB 3.0 and the price seemed pretty good for really both options. The USB 3.0 was $200, and the Thunderbolt version was $240 USD. When I started to look at this option in more detail, I found some pretty big problems. The USB 3.0 version seemed to be very picky in what kind of chipset the motherboard on the computer had, whether that was a laptop or a desktop machine. Now, sometimes it can be quite difficult to find the chipset information on a new laptop, and I was getting a new laptop as part of this process as well. The other thing that I found is that the Intensity Shuttle worked for some streaming applications, but it didn't work for all of them. So I was a little bit hesitant to go that route. So I started looking at other options, and there weren't very many. In fact, I only really found one that looked like it was going to be a reliable solution to get HDMI into a computer over USB 3.0. And what I found was this right here. This is a Magewell XI100D USB HDMI. It's a super long, crazy model name, but it happens to be a very cool product. It's very simple. It only has two connections. There's an HDMI in and a USB 3.0 out. There's no buttons. There are two lights here to tell you when it's connected and when there's kind of signal or it's doing something on the little capture device here. And the best part is that this is a plug and play device that requires no software and it works on PC, Mac, and Linux. That is pretty incredible. It also works with a variety of resolutions, all the way down to 640 by 480, and all the way up to 1920 by 1200, which is larger than HD, at frame rates up to 60 frames a second at 1920 by 1200. It also handles different frame rates. So it'll do 60 frames a second, it'll do 59.94, it'll do 50, 30, 29.97, and 25 frames a second. It also handles deinterlacing of the HDMI input. And that is a very important thing because a lot of cameras will send the video signal, no matter what the frame rate actually is, as 60i, and then it has little codes or little flags in the HDMI signal to help the device on the other end basically decode that and put those 60 interlaced frames together in a progressive way, the way that the sensor is actually capturing the information. And this is because 60i was kind of the old legacy video format at the time, and so camera makers developed different ways to get things like 30p and 24p over a 60i signal by kind of breaking it up and sending it in this way. But this little device takes care of all of that, and you don't have to worry about anything. Basically, any frame rate that most cameras will shoot from 60 frames per second down this will handle, it'll do the deinterlacing, and to the computer, it just looks like a video imaging device. It looks like a webcam. There is no software, there is no drivers. So, that makes it work with almost every software or streaming application out there. Basically, any streaming application that will work with a webcam will work with this because it shows up as a webcam in your computer, which is fantastic. Now, what about the video quality? The video quality is very, very good. It's essentially uncompressed with 422 color, and that is very high quality. That's something that you only find on more professional level cameras. So it can take that really great looking HDMI output that is uncompressed in 422 color, which has more color information than when you record on these types of cameras, and it preserves that quality all the way through to your computer. You can also use more than one of these USB 3.0 to HDMI capture devices on the same system, which means you can use different software applications that use multiple cameras because you can use multiple of these little guys here and then you can set up multiple cameras. But perhaps maybe you wanna go a step further and you wanna get a real HDMI production switcher to do multiple cameras, computer inputs, 
green screen, lower thirds, bugs. You can do that. And all you have to do with just one of these is add an HDMI production switcher. So it's very easy to go from a really great looking video stream to a full blown television studio with multiple cameras with the addition of some more hardware because this gets the video into your computer in a very, very high quality way. Now, in addition to this working for all of the streaming applications out there, you can also find software to record the video stream on your computer in a higher quality than you can on the actual camera. So on these cameras, you're going to be recording at AVC HD, which is H.264, and that's going to be throwing away a lot of color information, and it's not gonna look as good as the HDMI signal. And with this, you can get that HDMI signal and you can record it in your computer and you can use a lossless video codec so that you can essentially preserve all of the video quality, which is much, much higher than you can get with any of these consumer cameras. The only downside to this is that it is a little bit expensive. This one little dongle here is $300. Now that may seem like a lot, but there are really not a whole lot of options when you're looking at getting HDMI into your computer. In fact, there's not a lot of options to get HD video into your computer in a format and in a way that you can stream and have it look like a webcam so that it works with all of the streaming software. There may be some other options that do some compression or kind of encode the video, but this is the best quality, the best looking device that I've found and unfortunately, it does come at a little bit of a price of $300. Now, the one downside to this, if you're on a Mac, is that the audio coming in over the HDMI gets compressed and the quality is not super great. If you're trying to use a microphone with your camera and then get the video and the audio to come in on one stream over the HDMI and then into USB 3.0 to your computer and you're on a Mac, that might not work out so well because the audio doesn't sound that great on a Mac. However, there's a very easy solution to that, which we're going to look at coming up in another lesson, and that's just using a different audio interface because all of these streaming services let you pick the video source and the audio source separately. So you can use this for your video, get the high quality video, and then you can pick something else to use as the audio input. And that's great on a Mac, but on a PC, it works perfect and you get great quality audio with the great quality video over that HDMI and then into the computer via USB 3.0. And this is gonna work for Mac, PC, and Linux. Did I mention Linux? It works for Linux too. That is crazy for those one or two of you out there who use Linux. This is gonna work for you too and it's gonna look great. You're gonna see how great it looks in an upcoming lesson. But for now, we need to talk about how to set up the lights to make you look great. And that's coming up in the next lesson. Even with a camera setup that looks much better than a webcam, you still need to think about lighting. In this lesson, you're gonna to learn to build a simple, inexpensive lighting rig that doesn't take up a lot of space. Now, I could talk for hours about lighting and all the different options out there, but what I wanna do here is tell you what I know is going to work very well. And that is a daylight balanced soft box. This is going to be the best solution for most people. Now you can branch out from here and you can get creative and experiment all you want, but I know that this is going to work for most of you out there. So let me show you how to put something like this together. So I mentioned daylight. What's the deal with daylight color? Well, your camera is likely going to have two presets that you can be sure are going to look great with a different color temperature of light. You're going to have a daylight preset and a tungsten color preset. I'm fairly confident that almost all cameras that you are ever going to use are going to have at least those two. Now of those two, daylight I think is the most versatile because if you're ever shooting during the day and you have a window in your space and there's sunlight or skylight or light from the outside coming in, that is daylight colored light and you want to be able to match that. What you don't want is to use a light source that is much more yellow. If you do, and you set your camera's white balance for let's say tungsten, 
you are going to look okay, but the light coming in from the outside is going to look like alien blue light. So I think it's best to stick with daylight colored lights so that you can match whenever you're in a space that has a window. Now it's best to kind of control the lighting and block all the light coming in from the window, but sometimes you just can't. So daylight colored lights are the way to go. When it comes to daylight colored artificial lighting sources, you basically have two options, LED and CFL. I would recommend going with CFL lamps, lamps that look like these at the moment. I'm gonna tell you where to get the best looking lamps for the best price. Because right now, although you can find LEDs that look fantastic, that have color that looks almost identical to sunlight, they are very expensive. Can we get the same color or close to it with a CFL? Yes, but first let's talk about what it means when I say color and good color. What is that? Different kinds of artificial lighting render colors differently. Now, that may sound confusing, but you've probably seen this in the old days, five or six years ago, these type of CFLs, if you put them in your bathroom and you looked in the mirror, you would say, man, I look sick. And that's true because they had a heck of a lot of green in the output and they had a very low what's called color rendering index. Color rendering index is the ability for a lighting source to render a group of very specific colors and then those colors are averaged to give you something called a color rendering index. The sun renders everything perfectly. That is the standard. That's the gold standard for color and that has a color rendering index of 100. Tungsten and halogen lights, almost all of them, also render colors perfectly. So they get a score of 100, a CRI of 100. LED and CFLs, most of them, especially the lights that you'll find at your local hardware store, fall far below that. All of them are around 80 to 85 CRI. Now that's perfectly fine for lighting up your house because your eye interprets colors a little bit differently than the camera does. And so to your eye, a CRI of 85 looks pretty good. To the camera, it doesn't look that great. It probably is going to look a little green and that's problematic. At this point in time, I recommend that you check out two different types of CFLs. Bluemax HD lighting is a really good option. These are fairly inexpensive. These particular lamps are 26 watt, which is I think a little bit more than a 100 watt equivalent. They have a CRI that they say is 93. I'm guessing it's somewhere between 90 and 93 because I've seen two different ratings on two different sites. To my eye and to the camera, the color quality is pretty good. It's not the best CFLs that I've seen. The best CFLs that I've seen are made by KinoFlow. Those are only available in a 26 watt version and they're $25 a piece. So a light like this would cost $25. And for this setup, we're gonna be using multiple bulbs. So that can get pretty expensive pretty quick. But I think these Bluemax HD lighting lamps look pretty good and that's what I'm going to use. So for this setup, you're going to need a few of these because we're going to modify the light. We're not just going to put this in a clamp light and stick it up there, although you could and get pretty good results. So at the very least, you're gonna need two of these Blue Max HD 26 watt lamps. These run about $10 online, USD plus shipping. To make them work with just one socket, you're also going to need this two to one socket adapter. We're also gonna be using a photography umbrella softbox, or sometimes it's referred to as an octabox. I'm gonna show you that in a second. You're also going to need a fairly sturdy light stand like I have right here. You can find these for about $30 a piece, or sometimes you can find them as little as $50 a pair on Amazon. These are kind of the bare minimum of what I would set any light or really anything on. You also need some way to kind of adapt a traditional kind of Edison light socket here, a twisty socket to this light stand. So you need this very strangely named AC socket light stand adapter. We'll pop this guy on top of our light stand, put our lights in here and then attach the umbrella to this. And that's gonna be the basis for our lighting setup. The next step is attaching this umbrella here. This is a 30 inch Octabox soft box. So this is basically an umbrella or it's an umbrella shape. It's kind, of, it's kind of got a parabolic shape, so it's not your typical 
kind of walking in the rain umbrella. It's much more curved, and this is actually good because I think it does a better job of kind of directing the light forward. And so these usually have a zipper on one of these flaps here that you can just put over your light stand. And then the shaft goes right in this hole here. Sometimes you need to loosen up the tilt adjustment to get these lined up. There we go. I like to slide these all the way back and then very gently just lock it in place. Uh, with a lot of this photo stuff, if you apply too much pressure to any of these knobs, you will break it. This uh, socket stand adapter, you can find these online for uh, around six, maybe eight, maybe $10. These are mostly plastic. They will work fine if you treat them nicely and you don't crank down on the knobs super tight. Basically snug is good enough. So this would be suitable for one lamp, but we wanna use two lamps because on the front of this soft box, we are going to put a diffuser. And this is basically just a white piece of nylon fabric. And what this is going to do is take these two bulbs and turn it into one lighting source that's much, much, much larger. And this is going to make the shadows on your face much more pleasing. It's going to make you look nice. Now, if you need more output, you can always just take this off and use this as just kind of a giant reflector. The shadow quality will be not as nice because you'll get kind of a hard shadow. In fact, if you use two bulbs, you will get two shadows, but sometimes you have to do what you have to do if you need more light output. So I'm going to screw into this socket here, this two to one socket adapter, and this socket adapter is unplugged and off. Sometimes it can be a little tricky to line up these lamps to uh, be out of the way of the shaft here. You do wanna be careful when you're threading in the lamps because it can be very easy to strip out the tiny little metal threads in both this two to one adapter here and the socket stand adapter. So if I turn this on here, you might be able to hear a tiny bit of buzzing. That should go away in a minute or two as these warm up. These also get a good bit brighter as they warm up. Now you may notice that these look a little bit green or the color isn't quite exact compared to these other lights that I'm using to light up me. That's because these bulbs are about 5,000 Kelvin and these other lights that I'm using to light up me and the rest of uh, my studio here are more like 56 or 5,800 Kelvin. So these are going to look a little bit warmer. They may look a tiny bit green on this particular camera. For whatever reason, they look a little green on my main camera here. And the camera I'm going to show you for doing the web streaming, they actually look just fine and they don't look green at all. I'm going to attach the diffuser panel, which is just Velcro, super easy. Because I have this front diffusion panel on this front panel here is acting as the actual light source. And because it's so big relative to me and my face, it's going to produce really nice looking shadows, shadows that are not very hard edged, that have a nice kind of gradation from the light part to the dark part. And that's going to be really nice. It's also going to be nice because it's so large that you may not have to use multiple light sources if you position it right. And that's something that we're gonna look at coming up in the next lesson. In this lesson, I'm gonna show you how to set up this exact lighting look with the parts that we just went over and maybe a few extra parts that you can find at your local hardware store. So let's say, for example, that you wanted to do a very simple kind of stream with your desk here, a little laptop computer, and you wanted to set up the camera and make it look great for that. Well here's how you would get the lights to look right. Right now you are looking at this setup with only this one light. That's the only lighting in this space. There's no windows in here and this room is painted black um, because this is my studio here. So it's very, very dark. You're not gonna get a lot of light reflecting uh, from this one light. So I can get the light to look right for me in this position on this camera right here. And we're gonna pretend for a second that this is the camera that I'm going to be doing my video stream on. You can see that it's a little bit tighter as you kind of widen out the shot. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to place your lights because you're gonna to have to kind of get them 
further back and, and further out. So with this one light, a really simple kind of way to get this to look great is to bring it in close and get it out of the shot of that camera. Right now my streaming camera is about six feet away from me and that's doing a good job of kind of compressing this shot. It's making me look a little bit better because the camera back at that distance allows me to kind of zoom in and that's gonna compress the features of my face and also show less of this background here, which is a good thing. But I need to find a good spot for this light. Now I just kind of set it here, but I think it needs to be adjusted. So what I'm looking for is for a little bit of dimensionality to the face. I don't want the same power of light on the right and the left because that's gonna make my face look very flat. That's not super natural. What I wanna see is just a little bit of a difference between the bright side and the darker side. So if this was my only light, or this is my brightest light, I'm gonna call this the key light. This is my main light. And any other kind of light that I either reflect onto my face or I shoot from another light source is going to be a fill light if it's coming from a different direction other than the main light. So this is my key light. And right now I can see that it's lighting most of this side of my face, but it's also getting pretty much all the way over to here. And then this side right over here is pretty much in shadow. So that is pretty close to how I might want it, but I need to adjust it a little bit because I can see the soft box in the monitor. So let me do that and see if I can find a better spot for it. I'm just gonna turn another little clamp light on here so you can see where I'm positioning the soft box because black on black, just is not very easy to see. So right now, I can see the corner of this in my shot. I'm just gonna try and move it up a little bit. And that looks like it's out of the shot of this camera here, uh, which should be pretty good. Now, I can try and move it over, uh, but eventually I'm going to get the light stand in the shot. So I wanna get the light stand just out of the shot it should be just about there. That looks pretty good. And I also wanna get the height of this to where it's just out of the frame. I'm just gonna tip this so I can see the light a little bit better. Cool. That looks pretty close right there. So that looks pretty good. I'm getting a nice amount of light on my face. The exposure looks okay. Now, if I wanted to fill in this side of my face, I have a couple of options. A very simple option is to just take the light that's coming from this light source and just bounce it back on me because not all of the light from this light source is hitting me. Some of it's going over here so we can see my hand. And if I put a reflector just out of the frame of this camera, right? So just like right here, I can take this light that's hitting my hand and bounce it back to my face. And I was using a reflector before. That's what this white disc is here. And so I can use this in a different way to bounce the light back on this side of my face. Let me show you how to do that. Now, this is a five in one collapsible reflector. It has a diffusion material in the middle. It has a silver side, a black side, a gold side, and a white side. The silver side and the white side are very good for reflecting without changing the color but the white side just doesn't have a whole lot of punch. Because this light is not super bright, the white side's not gonna get it done. So I'm gonna switch it over to the silver side, and I'm just gonna take a little clamp here and clamp it to another light stand. Now you could clamp this to pretty much anything. I don't have a whole lot here to clamp this to, so I'm gonna use a light stand. And again, all I'm really looking for is this to be out of the shot of this camera. So you can see if I get this turned just the right way, I think this actually has to be just a hair higher. There we go. <clears throat> and if I get this turned just right, it's actually bouncing a pretty good amount of light back on this side of my face. So this is without, and this is with it back. So that's going to help to fill in the shadows on this side of my face. I don't necessarily need another light, although I could use another softbox on that side of my face. I don't really have to though. I can get away with using a reflector just like this. Now what about the rest of the room? Well, in this particular case, it's pretty dark because all of the walls in here are painted black and there are no windows. I don't have a lot of other ambient light to deal with. 
If you did want to throw a little bit of light on the back wall, it's very easy to do. Basically, you can just take another one of those Bluemax lighting lamps, throw it in a hardware store clamp light, and just clamp it to something right behind where you're sitting. Let me show you what that looks like. So what I have here is a hardware store clamp light. I have a Bluemax 26 watt daylight balanced bulb in here. To the front, I have taped on a piece of diffusion filter made by Roscoe, and this is to basically just spread the light out everywhere and make it a very broad, wide lighting source. And to attach this, I could use a really short lighting stand, or I can just clamp it right to the back of my chair here in order to make sure the clamp holds very strong because these clamping mechanisms are really not that great. I'm just gonna use a secondary clamp here to clamp on the other side like that. There. And now I can throw a little bit of light here on this back wall. Now we could get even more fancy. I could say take a light and point it back at me in the other direction to give me a little light under here. Let me show you what that looks like. So again, I'm gonna use another hardware store clamp light with a bulb and a secondary clamp. And I'm just gonna clamp this to a really short stand, but you can clamp it to anything that you want down here. And uh, I can kind of position this right down here and then just point it up this way. This will kind of give me a little back illumination. Boom, a little highlight under the arms here. That's looking pretty nice. I can also take this light and move it a little bit further back, get it a little bit higher to give me a little edge light around the side here. You might like that. Let me show you how that looks. So you can see where the light is in this main camera here. I'm just gonna scooch this off to the side so that it's out of the shot from the secondary camera here from my main streaming camera. Just kind of point it to the side so it's hard to see here. I'll move my fake wall, you can see. And so that's gonna give me a nice little edge light here on the side right around here, a little edge light on the, on the face here. So I wanna show you one other element that you may want to add. And as you may have noticed, I've moved things around just a little bit because I'm going to use this lighting setup for the rest of the course. And I wanna show you one thing that I like to do. It's not necessary, but it works pretty well for this kind of situation where I'm wearing a dark shirt. I have kind of darker hair and I have a darker background. So right now, I still have the same elements. I have my 30 inch, Octabox here with my two Blue Max 26 watt daylight bulbs in there. My one reflector over here. My hardware store clamp light with a little piece of diffusion taped on the front. And that's doing the background light. I don't have the side light here because I'm going to use that clamp light to do something else. So here again is just another hardware store clamp light and another Blue Max HD daylight 26 watt lamp in there. And what I wanna do for this light is, I want to add a little light on my hair and my shoulders to help separate me from this background. So to do that, I'm going to use one more light stand. Now at this point, I am using three light stands. I have one here, and you're gonna need at least one for the Octabox, but for the reflector and the background light, you might be able to clamp those to whatever you may have over here and on the floor. I mean, on the floor, you could get just a cinder block and clamp the light to that, and that will work just fine. Same thing for the reflector, you can find something to clamp that to. So you don't necessarily need three light stands, but they are pretty inexpensive, so you know, not a huge deal. But for the hair light, I am going to use one more light stand. This time, I'm going to use the same kind of eight and a half foot light stand that I'm using for the Octabox. I put a sandbag on this one leg. Normally I like to put sandbags on all my light stands, but for this one in particular, this is going to be very critical that I get a sandbag on this because to this light stand, I'm going to add this 40 inch grip arm here. So this is called a grip arm. It's basically a 40 inch long, five eighths inch tube that has been riveted to this thing right here, which is a grip head. So I'm gonna put this on the light stand and this is going to be very important that you use a reasonably heavy duty light stand because one of those really cheap six foot stands, this is not going to hold up so well. You're gonna to attach to the top and it's probably going to snap off. So this is going to give me a little bit of a boom here. So to the end of this, I'm going to take my clamp light here and clamp it right here and use my secondary clamp to just bite right on here. I'm actually gonna swap out this uh, 
this secondary clamp here because this doesn't have a ton of clamping power. It's a little bit worn out from old age. So I'm gonna grab one of these metal A spring clamps here, which these have a lot more clamping power. I'm gonna take the power cord here. I have attached to this a Velcro cable tie. And I like to just strap this to the boom. And I wanna get this right above where my head is and then slightly back. So if my head is right about here, right? I basically want the light essentially right where it is, but I want it behind me. If it's directly over me, I'm gonna get the light spilling down on my head here. That's gonna look kind of Frankenstein-ish. I don't want that. So I'm gonna pull this back a little bit and then I'm gonna get it up nice and high. Now I'm gonna look at my secondary camera here, the one that's kind of set up for my streaming and I wanna make sure that it's high enough so that I am not going to get flaring in the lens. So now <clears throat> I have a nice little light here and it's giving me a little separation here on my shoulders and my head. You can see I get a little sparkle in the hair and a little bit of light dancing on the shoulders and that really helps to set me apart from this dark background here. Now, if I am having problems with flare here, and that can sometimes happen, I may need to improvise a little lens hood. So I have a little piece of black industry tape here. It's like high-tech gaff tape. And I might be able to just put a piece of tape over this lens just to make a little lens hood. So with that little piece of tape there, I've cut out the flaring on this front camera there. And you can see that it does make quite a bit of difference on my shoulders and, uh, and my hair there. And this is the look that I personally like. I think this is a nice professional look. I have my key light, my fill light. Again, I can make this more dramatic by just getting rid of the, uh, of the fill light here. Um, if you want a little more contrast on this side of your face, you can do that. Pretty easy to bounce back. And again, you don't have to use a, a five-in-one reflector like this. You can use a craft store piece of whiteboard that you spray paint silver. You could use a cardboard piece that you glue some aluminum foil on, the shiny side or the dull side. Lots of different options for bouncing. I wouldn't use a mirror because that's gonna be a little bit maybe harsh to look at, but you may find that it works fine for you. So you may have to experiment there. But I really like the hair light here. This is kind of my standard three light setup. Fill light, hair light, background light. And then technically this is four lights because this acts as a second light source here. So now that you know how to set up the lights to make it look great, the next thing to look at is camera settings. And that's coming up next. Fully automatic camera settings are most likely not going to work. And you will need to dial in the settings on your camera to make sure that the color and the exposure doesn't change during the stream. In this lesson, you will learn how to get it right. So you're looking at the back of the camera here. This is the LCD. I know it looks a little strange, but I wanna walk you through what camera settings that I have set up. So I'm gonna jump in here to the menu and just go through a few things. Bear with me here. This is a touch screen and it's a little bit, well, it's a little bit touchy. <laughs> First, a few things, uh, digital zoom, always turn that off. I'm not gonna be dealing with the zoom speed, so set to variable and that's fine. AF mode is currently set to instant AF, that's fine. Uh, focus assistance is on, that means when I focus on the camera, it's going to kind of punch in and show me a zoomed view. Let me show you if I turn that to manual focus and I use the focus dial on the front of the camera, it bumps the screen into 100% so you can see exactly kind of a zoomed in view so you can get it dialed in perfectly. Face detection. This is something that you may want to experiment with. Perhaps with your camera, it doesn't work so well. I'm gonna leave it on for now. A few other standard things, image effects, we don't want any of that. Windscreen is set to off. If we were going to try and take advantage of the internal microphone in the camera, we don't want the windscreen filter on. Microphone attenuator, basically we have two options, automatic and on. So I'm gonna leave it on automatic for now. I'm not using the onboard microphone, so that's not gonna be a big deal. There is one control dial on the front of this camera and that is currently set to focus, but I could change that to exposure. Focus is fine for now. If I jump into the second tab here, 
Let me just show you the options here. If I was ever going to record on the camera card, I want it set to the highest bit rate, which is 24 megabits. It's basically as high as it goes and I wanna capture the best quality. If I was ever recording my video stream simultaneously on the camera, as well as doing kind of a live broadcast. Frame rate, this is going to be something that you may need to experiment with. Right now I have it set to 24F, which means 24 frames per second. Now, this camera and most cameras in this generation of around 2010 to even currently probably, don't actually send 24 frames a second over the HDMI. A lot of these cameras will send a 60i signal, but it's flagged and coded in such a way that the device on the other side knows that it's 24 frames a second and can kind of put it back together so it actually looks like 24 frames a second on the other side. Now the Magewell video capture device doesn't list 24 frames a second in the specification. So I probably wanna switch that over to PF30, which is another kind of strange frame rate where it's actually 30 frames a second, but it records it in 60i when you're recording to the camera. But I think that's probably the safest to start with, but you can experiment to find out what's going to work. I know for this particular camera, all of these send the video signal over as 60i, and because the Magewell can handle 60i, it will interpolate those. The Magewell does the deinterlacing for you. I think 24 frames will work, but it may look a little strange. There is one other setting that you wanna look for, and that's output on-screen displays. This is the setting that you need to turn off. When you do this, the HDMI will now be clean without any overlays, and that's exactly what we want. So those are the main menu things that you need to look for. Next, we need to adjust the picture so that this looks the best. So in recording programs here, I have some options, program AE, uh, shutter priority, aperture priority, portrait. I have no idea what portrait does. And then cinema mode, which it is currently set in. But just look at the difference in the picture, and I know it's gonna be kind of hard to gauge, but when I switch this over to program AE, you can see that it got a heck of a lot brighter. And if you were looking at the HDMI output, what you would see is that the sensor gain got cranked up, which means that there's going to be more noise in the signal. It's impossible to tell on this tiny screen but Program AE lets the sensor be turned up in volume to account for lower light situations. I'm not dealing with that because I've lit this appropriately and it's gonna look fine. So watch what happens when I switch it back to cinema mode. You can see that the exposure darkens. And I know it looks a little dark now, but I've already set the exposure on this camera and I know that it looks right. So I'm going to leave it in cinema mode. I'm gonna jump back here. The next thing to look at is the white balance. On here I have automatic white balance. That's one that you do not want because you don't want it changing the white balance during your stream. That's not gonna be great. I do have a few other options. There's a custom white balance. So for this to work, I need something that's white that mostly fills the screen that is being hit by the lights that I want to white balance to. And then I can set the white balance. And now it's going to use that custom white balance. And that could be as simple as a, a whiteboard, a big white piece of paper that you zoom in on. But if we just look at the difference between the custom white balance, and I know it's gonna be hard to tell, but if I switch over to daylight, there shouldn't be a huge shift because for whatever reason, this camera likes the daylight color of these lights and it looks pretty neutral. So I'm gonna leave it on daylight. That's probably your best bet if you don't have a custom white balance. If you do have a custom white balance, you may want to experiment with that because that's going to lock it in and that's probably gonna be a little bit closer to what your lights are actually doing. Mic level, again, if I was trying to use a microphone with this camera, I would want to set that to manual and then you can see here the mic level and I would dial that in so that I was getting a nice juicy signal somewhere between this uh, 12 here and the zero, but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to use the microphone. Um, and in fact, I don't want to see the mic level, so I'm going to turn it back to automatic so I don't have to look at that. Focus, right now it's set to manual. It's going to be kind of tricky to manually focus, so what you might want to do is get something 
in the picture, that's going to be about where your head is going to be. All right. Now you can see I have this strange blue outline. That's actually called focus peaking. That's showing you what's in focus. But if you want to dial it in exact, get something and put it in the plane that your face is going to be or pretty close to it. So this is actually a focus target, but you can use anything that's in the same plane as where you are going to be uh, sitting, where your face is going to be. And then you can adjust the focus so that that's perfectly in focus. And you'll see that those little lines get nice and bright, those blue lines, that's focus peaking. Your camera may not have focus peaking. Uh, this does, it's in the settings here, and I can change the color to red or yellow. Red actually looks pretty good. I can turn uh, peaking and black and white on. Sometimes it's easier to get focus in black and white, but I'm gonna leave black and white off. Exposure, right now it's set to automatic. And when I touch the screen, it's going to set the exposure for the highlights. I think actually it can't turn it up anymore um, until I go in and I change the program here to uh, program mode because it won't let the sensor get any brighter. But you can see if it's on highlight mode, like it is now, it's going to try and make that light gray area kind of be exposed properly for the highlights, which is wrong in this particular case. So if I jump back to exposure and I set this on normal and I go back and now I set the exposure, it's going to make that about 70% luminance or somewhere in that neighborhood. You can see it's actually a little bit less uh, right now. If I bump it up a half a stop, it's going to start dancing there. Those are called zebras and I have the zebra pattern set to 70% so that it's showing me things that are basically exposed to 70% luminance. But I have the option to push this all around. You can see I can push this up to 100% and this will show me when things get to just about 100% luminance, which means they're essentially clipped and pushed full white. If I turn zebra off, that light gray target is now completely white. And that's bad. So here's how I would do it. I would jump back out of here, put this back on cinema, which is going to darken this right down, go back into exposure, set it on manual, put the zebras on 70%, and then see what that looks like. So if I jump in front of the camera here, and I get my face in here, it's looking pretty good. If I saw zebras on my face, I would know that it's a little bit hot and I may want to pull the exposure down a little bit. I can't actually go up from here unless I put it in another one of those modes. So you're gonna have to fiddle with the exposure to make it look right, but basically you do not wanna overexpose, especially on your face. And that's pretty much it. To review, basically we shut off any kind of auto anything that we don't want the camera to choose for us. So auto exposure, auto focus, auto white balance. If you're using the microphone, turn off the automatic mic gain and set it manually, and then dial everything in so it looks the best. I have my white balance set, I have my exposure set. I have this set to cinema, which is going to look the best on this camera. It's gonna be the cleanest output. My focus is set properly and all this jazz is turned off except for image stabilization because that's not going to be a big deal. Uh, if there is any kind of floor movement here, which I don't think I can do because this is a concrete floor, that's going to help to fix that. And then in the menu, make sure that your frame rate is set correctly. That may take some experimentation with the mage well to find out what looks the best. And then make sure that your on-screen displays are off. So now that you know how to dial in the settings on your camera, the next thing to look at is audio, and that's coming up in the next chapter. When it comes to microphones, just like cameras, you have a lot of options. Except that with microphones, you have probably 10 times as many options because great sounding microphones have been around for 30 or 40 years. In this lesson, you're gonna learn what to choose and what will work best with your style of presentation.
So in this type of application, you're trying to use a microphone to pick up the human voice. And for that, you have really a tremendous amount of options. Any type of microphone that sounds good usually sounds good on the human voice, but there are only a few types of microphones that work really well for different types of applications. So for kind of a video presentation, like I'm doing now, the two standard microphones that are used are a lapel microphone, which is clipped on to your clothing, sometimes called a lavalier microphone, and then a shotgun microphone, which is usually positioned up above the subject, right off camera, and then kind of pointed right at their mouth, because this microphone is extremely directional. They call it a shotgun microphone for a reason, because it really only picks up sound from right in front of the microphone, where a lot of other microphones have a wider pickup pattern, as it's called. So this type of microphone sounds great. This is a fantastic sounding microphone. It is quite expensive. This particular microphone costs about $550. And then to rig it, you need a nice stand and a boom pole, an XLR, and probably a shock mount like I have here. So it can get quite costly, but as long as you stay right in front of this type of microphone, it can sound fantastic. This is one of the best mics that I've ever used. The problem is with a shotgun microphone, if you start to wander or move side to side, because it's so extremely directional, your voice starts to dip very, very significantly. So I think for this type of application, for video streaming, a shotgun microphone is really not the best. So that really just leaves the lavalier microphone, which I'm using right here. These are fantastic microphones. They are very, very small, so they don't take up a lot of space. They don't look weird. These work very, very well because they're clipped right on you. They stay with you no matter where you move. I can move over here. I can move over here. And my voice sounds essentially exactly the same. A lot of times when folks think about a lavalier microphone, they usually think about a wireless lavalier microphone. And in fact, that's the type of microphone that I'm using here. But for a video stream, you really don't need to use a wireless microphone because you're probably going to stay in one spot. Even if you're standing up, you're probably not going to be doing a whole lot of walking around unless you have a camera crew and you know maybe multiple cameras. So a wired lavalier microphone is a fantastic option, and you can get one fairly inexpensively. Now, if you do some looking around, you're probably gonna find two different types of wired lavalier microphones. You're gonna find lavalier microphones with a 1 8 inch or 3.5 millimeter type connector, and then you'll find others with an XLR connector. An XLR connector is a three pin balanced audio connector, and it's used on professional devices. The lavalier microphones with the 3.5 millimeter connections might work if you plug them into your microphone input on your laptop or your computer, and you might be able to get away with plugging it into your camera, but you're going to have more problems with noise because those are usually unbalanced. And also, the preamp that's on your laptop or on your computer, and most likely on your camera, is awful. They're not very good. And so, when you turn the volume up on that preamp, it's going to be noisy in almost all situations. Plus, if you need a little bit of length, so say you're setting your camera six feet away so that you're getting that nice optical compression that you get when you use a higher focal length, using those unbalanced mic cables and extending those is a big problem because they basically act like a giant antenna and you're probably going to get some radio interference. What I would recommend is that you get the more professional lavalier with an XLR end on it. The wired lavalier microphone that I usually recommend and that I do have some experience using is the Shure SM93. This looks very similar to most of the other wired lavalier microphones that you'll see, but I know from experience that this microphone sounds great, and it sounds great for this application. The client that I worked with to set up this high quality video streaming rig, that's the microphone that I got for him, and it sounded fantastic right out of the box. The cool thing about this Shure microphone is that it has a low cut roll off, which means that it basically rolls off the frequencies below 100 hertz, which is great. That reduces a lot of the rumbles and a lot of the woof that you may get attaching the microphone to your body. And the way that I'm going to show you how to hook up the microphone doesn't really give us the opportunity to apply any audio processing. So having that low cut on the microphone is actually very handy.
So for most of you out there, I'm going to recommend that you get a wired lavalier microphone. I like the Shure SM93, but feel free to try any high quality XLR microphone that you like. Now, how do we get an XLR microphone into the computer? Well, there are a number of ways. What I found that works very well is a simple USB audio interface. Basically, this is a device that does a few things. It has a microphone input, it has phantom power. So for condenser microphones like that wired lavalier, these require some DC voltage on the microphone input to make the microphone work. They have electronics in them and they require something called phantom power to work. And so we have a microphone input, we have phantom power. It also has a preamp, so basically a small little amplifier that boosts the gain to get it to an appropriate level. Then it has an analog to digital converter and a USB output to go to your computer. Those elements right there are really all you need. And so this particular USB audio interface does have some extra things. It has two microphone inputs and it has four outputs and some other jazz that really you don't need. I'm showing you this because this is the one that I have, but you can get a version of this that's much more simple that has just one input. This particular USB audio interface cost about $70, but you can get a more simple one input version for around $30 to $40. Now, if you're going to be using your video streaming rig to do Skype or Google Hangouts or any other kind of communication where you need audio back from your computer, it's probably best to find one of these USB audio interfaces with a headphone out, but don't worry, almost all of them do. So that can be a little bit easier for your computer so it doesn't have to run multiple drivers for the incoming audio and the outgoing audio. If you use one of these USB audio interfaces, it's basically going to use that driver for the microphone input and the sound coming out of the computer, and it just makes things a little bit more simple. Now, I did want to mention another option. You can see I have one more microphone here. This is a dynamic microphone, and you may have seen some video streams or podcasts where the presenter is using kind of a big fat microphone on a boom, and they get that really close to their face, and it has kind of a, what I would call a radio or a broadcast type of sound. It's really big and beefy sounding and very full sounding. It's quite nice. To do that, you really need to get a microphone really close to your face. A lot of those microphones can be quite expensive. For example, the Heil PR40 microphone is very popular to use on kind of web streams and podcasts. But the thing is that you can get just about any decent sounding dynamic microphone. And if you get it nice and close to your face, it can sound really, really nice. For example, this microphone right here, this is a Shure Beta 57A. And I believe this microphone costs around $140, but if I get this right up close to my grill here, you can hear that it has a big, beefy, round, rich sound. And the reason why it sounds like that is because of something called proximity effect. Proximity effect happens when you have a directional microphone, so a microphone that is more sensitive in one direction. And the closer you get that microphone to the sound source, the more of a bass response you get. So if I pull this microphone away and I kind of re-level it, you can hear that it sounds much less full in those lower frequencies. But if I get it right close to my mouth, talking at the same volume, you can hear that there is a big sound difference. Now, these microphones are cool for a number of reasons. One, it makes you sound big and beefy and full. No matter if you're a man or a woman, these sound great. It sounds good to get the microphone really close to the sound source. The second reason is that it does a great job of rejecting sounds that don't come from directly in front of the microphone. So you can see if I hold this microphone right here and I just move my face over here, you're going to hear a very significant drop off in the sound. And as soon as I move my face right in front of the microphone, you're going to hear that come right up again. So this works on the back of the microphone as well. So if I flip this microphone around and I try and talk like this, you're not going to hear much out of the microphone. The only thing you're going to hear is the sound bouncing off of the room and then coming back in this way because these really don't get a lot of sound coming in to the back of the microphone depending on the type of microphone you're using. So that's really good if you have any kind of noise in your environment because the noise in the environment, the ambient noise, no matter what it is, compared to the sound of your voice, because it's so close to the microphone, is going to be drastically reduced.
The one bad thing is that in order for this to work, you have to have the microphone close, which means that it's in your shot. Now, for some presentations, that may work. There's plenty of successful podcasts and web streams that you can see that they have the microphone and it's kind of right up in their grill here, especially if you use a tighter shot. It really doesn't take up too much of the frame. Uh, but you see, I do have a problem kind of holding it right now. I'm just hand holding the microphone. And so I need to have a way to hold the microphone to get both of my hands free. And that has some adjustability so that when I move around, I can get the microphone to kind of track with wherever I am sitting. I'm going to show you exactly how to rig a microphone with a nice desktop boom stand coming up in another lesson. But first, I want to show you how to rig the lavalier microphone so that it looks great and it sounds great. Check that out coming up next. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to set up a lavalier microphone so that it looks and sounds great. So setting up a lavalier microphone is fairly simple. Most of the time you want to rig it through your clothing so that you don't have a wire dangling all over. Usually you want the position of the microphone to be in the center and about maybe three inches below your chin if you put your chin on your chest. So somewhere in that neighborhood is where I like to have it. Now you may have to move it up or down depending on your particular style of talking. Sometimes you can get kind of a weird breath that comes out of your mouth that hits the microphone that makes it kind of do that sort of thing. So moving the microphone up an inch or down an inch can help with that. So this is rigged pretty simply here on my shirt. I just use a small piece of tape to tape the wire down to my undershirt. And this is just to prevent the wire if it gets pulled from tearing the microphone off of my shirt. I can tape it to the inside of this shirt if I want, but if I'm wearing an undershirt, I usually like to tape it under here. And then I just take a small loop of this wire coming out of my shirt and it just gives me just enough slack to clip it to the front of my shirt here. Now, if you don't wear a button down shirt, you're going to have to come up with another way of rigging that lavalier microphone. You can clip it right here to the top of a t-shirt or a v-neck shirt. Usually you're going to want to tape it to the inside of your shirt so that the microphone isn't pulling this down and looking untidy. The only thing you want to be aware of is that if you tape the microphone pretty high up on your neck here, you can accidentally rub the microphone with your chin or your neck. So you want to make sure that the microphone is in a place that's not going to come into contact with your clothes or your neck because that's going to make some really nasty sounds. If none of those options work, you can get creative and maybe bring the wire under your collar here and just have it poking out and either tape it in place or maybe just clip it on the edge here and just run the wire around your back, put a little piece of tape on the back of your shirt to hold the microphone wire in place. If you don't have anywhere to clip it to, it's possible that you can get the lavalier microphone to be rigged under your clothes, although that is a little bit tricky and you do run more of a risk of getting kind of clothes rustling in the microphone. There are ways that you can kind of tape the microphone in between two pieces of tape and then stick that to your shirt and stick that to your body so that the microphone doesn't move. And you can also look at products that are designed to basically pad the microphone from that clothes rustling sound. There's a company called Rycoat that makes a product called Undercovers, which are kind of specialized pads that are made just for that. But in general, it's probably best to try and rig the microphone outside of your clothes to completely avoid the clothes rustling. Almost all of the XLR lavalier microphones that I've seen have an end on them that's very, very thick. And that's where it has all of the electronics. Now sometimes you can take that end and you can get it in one of these XLR inputs, but sometimes they're just a little bit too thick. And in that case, you're going to need a short little XLR cable. It really doesn't have to be too much longer than a foot. This is like two and a half feet, um, but you certainly don't need much longer than this. Just so you can plug this in, to your audio interface and then plug that big beefy end connector with all the electronics into the other side of this so that you can actually get it to work. Setting levels on your lav is probably going to take a little bit of experimentation. If you are a seasoned presenter, then you have a pretty steady tone and you do not have a lot of fluctuations in your volume. But if you're just starting out, you're going to want to maybe go a little bit conservative on the gain so that you don't clip the microphone input, which will probably sound distorted and crackly, and that's not gonna be very good. When I'm setting the microphone gain on my own microphone, I usually set it to where the peaks are coming up to right about negative six, maybe a little bit higher, because I know that I speak fairly consistently and that's safe for me. But if you try that, you may run into a situation where you have a very hot signal and it clips. So you may have to set it a little bit lower, maybe negative 10, maybe a little bit lower than that. 
You don't want to set it too low because your mic is not going to be processed too much after it goes into your audio interface, and that's going to be too quiet for doing web streams. So you are going to want to have a nice juicy signal, but you want to avoid clipping the microphone. Now, if you do a lot of video streaming and you want to really upgrade the sound of your microphone, you could look at getting something like a channel strip, which has a microphone preamp, but they will also have things like an EQ, a compressor, an expander, a de-esser, and maybe even a limiter to basically really juice up and make your vocal sound fantastic. It's probably not something that you need to look at right now, but it's something that you may want to explore in the future and something that I'll cover in a future course. So those are the basics for setting up a lavalier microphone. In the next lesson, you're going to learn how to set up that dynamic microphone with a really nice desktop boom stand and make it sound great. In this lesson, you're going to learn what to look for and how to set up a microphone for that big, rich broadcast sound. Before I show you how to set one up, let's talk about what types of mics will work. Typically when you see these types of microphones used on podcasts and video streams, they are big, gigantic, dynamic microphones. Sometimes they may be condensers, but most of the popular ones are dynamic microphones. And usually you'll see three specific microphones used. The Shure SM7B, the EV RE20, and the Heil PR40. All of those are fantastic sounding microphones, and they're all quite expensive. But the thing is, you don't need a big giant microphone to get a big giant sound. You can use almost any good sounding dynamic microphone. The microphone I'm going to show you for this demonstration is a Shure Beta 57A. My wife actually bought this for me 15 years ago for a snare drum microphone for my drum set. Now that doesn't mean it's going to sound like a snare drum because a good microphone for an instrument is usually going to be a good microphone for voice. And in fact, this does sound pretty good on my voice. And the reality is that when you get a microphone really close to the sound source, many microphones will sound fantastic. So this microphone is around $140, but there are many other less expensive options that will work. The Shure SM57, the Shure SM58, the Sennheiser E835, and many, many others. Those are just the microphones that I have a lot of experience with. As far as a recommendation, I would go down to your local music store and see if they have some microphones set up for you to demo and pick the one that sounds the best on your voice. If you don't like it, return it and try a different one. So let's talk about how to actually rig this up so you can get the microphone right up in your grill when you're doing your presentation. Now you may be thinking, I'll just use a boom stand like this. This is a standard microphone boom stand that you would find on stage and, and many other productions. And this will work to get the microphone in position. So I can just adjust the tilt arm here and adjust the length of this and lock it into position. And I can get this right into position fairly easily. And I can probably adjust this so that it's, uh, it's a little less intrusive into my video frame here. The problem is that when I'm moving around, like I showed you before, my voice is going to drop significantly if I move away from this microphone. Now that's something that's good because if I have to cough, I can just lean over here and cough and it'll be really, really quiet. But let's say I'm a little bit lively and I'm moving around a little bit or I want to lean over here and talk about something. This kind of stand is really not going to work very well for that because in order for me to move the microphone over kind of horizontally, I have to do a number of adjustments here and kind of reposition this. And that's way too much work. So this is not the right tool for the job. However, this contraption here is. And let me show you how to set that up. So this scary looking thing is a desktop boom stand. And you've probably seen one of these used on a podcast or some video stream or a radio show at some point in your life. It's really actually quite simple. It has this scissor mechanism and these springs to basically hold the microphone in position wherever you put it. And it works quite well. Now, this microphone stand is not terribly expensive. This costs around $58 USD on Amazon.com. I did add this $10 shock mount with a pop screen that I'm going to show you in a second. So, you know, you're looking at maybe $70 and it came with this XLR cable, which is one less thing. Installing this is fairly simple. It comes with two options. The first is very, very simple. This is just a little clamp here and it's got a hole where you just 
stick the end of this boom and the other is a little plate that you can screw down to your desk with three screws and that's going to be probably a much more sturdy option. I'm not going to show you how to set that up here because this is a plastic table and it won't work very well. And in fact, this clamp won't work very well on this plastic table because it's a little bit kind of flimsy on the side and I can't get enough clamping pressure to really make it stable. So for this demonstration, I've just attached a little piece of wood here with some bar clamps so I can show you how this works. So I'm just going to clamp this up here and I'm going to get it pretty snug. I don't want to crank the heck out of it because as long as it's fairly snug, it should be fine. If I need a more stable solution, you probably want to use that little screw down connector. Next, you just stick the end of it in the socket here. And there's a little screw here that I can kind of tension this and lock it down. Microphone goes in my little shock mount adapter. You could use a normal mic clip for this, but uh, I like this shock mount because it takes a lot of the rumble out of the microphone. And I can get this kind of in position, just like this. Attach the microphone cable. Now I can get this microphone into position and it's very, very easy. I can make small adjustments, so maybe I don't want it kind of this way. Maybe I want it more like this. Very easy. There's just a little thumb knob here. And the cool thing is, when I got this yesterday, I did very, very little to adjust it to get it to work like this. There's one little adjustment knob here that kind of controls the tension of this joint. And that's pretty much it. When I set this up to test it, it literally works like this right out of the box. So if I wanted to move kind of over here, I can just move the whole stand and move the microphone wherever I go and listen to this. That is essentially silent, right? I mean, I did not move the microphone levels down at all. You can hear it on my lav microphone, which is quite sensitive. That literally makes no noise. I can't even hear it. So this is very, very cool. Um, for $70, this is a fantastic setup. If you like the sound of this kind of in-your-face broadcast dynamic microphone. And I think it sounds pretty cool. Now, one thing you may run into with this type of microphone is issues with pops. You can see right there, I intentionally did a pretty big puff of air so that it would make that nasty sound. This type of microphone is designed for live use, and so it does have some foam underneath this metal screen here to help with those puffs of air, those plosives, a little bit, but it doesn't eliminate them completely. One of the nice things about those larger microphones is that they have some more kind of pop protection inside of the microphone, especially the Heil PR40. And I know the Shure SM7B comes with a giant foam screen, which does a lot to protect against that. Now I could add a foam windscreen to this microphone and that would probably completely eliminate any of those problems with those puffs of air, but maybe you don't like the look of a foam windscreen on there. So another option is you can use a pop filter and this particular shock mount here actually came with this pop filter. So with the pop filter installed, you can hear pop, pop, pop. Those plosives are greatly reduced, probably eliminated. And that's nice, but you can see there is a little distance here between the microphone and the pop filter. So I can't get right on the microphone like I could before. So that's kind of a downside. In this particular case, I would probably get rid of the pop screen and use a foam windscreen on here. The nice thing about this setup is that it is flexible. So instead of a dynamic microphone, I could use a little pencil condenser microphone, which you can actually get much cheaper, probably around 40 or $50, those sound really, really nice. And the great thing about a condenser microphone is that it has a much higher output than a dynamic microphone. It's something we didn't talk about so far. What you'll find is that you're going to have to crank up the volume a lot more with a dynamic microphone because they just don't have as high of an output compared to a condenser microphone, even a lapel microphone. And so when you crank up that preamp gain, you may start to hear a little bit of noise. This is going to depend a little bit on what kind of audio interface you get and what kind of preamp it has in there. Setting the level on a microphone like this 
is exactly the same as setting a level for a condenser microphone or a lavalier microphone or even a shotgun microphone. You want to aim for levels around negative six for peaks, maybe a little bit higher if you're very consistent. If you're not a very consistent presenter, maybe shoot a little bit lower. The thing you don't want to do is clip the input. That's going to sound bad. So that'll take a little bit of experimentation, but around negative six is a good place to start for those peaks on your audio meter. Now that you know how to set up this dynamic microphone, the next step is to get everything working with a streaming application, and that's coming up next. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how to get this rig set up with Google Hangouts. Now, maybe you had a different streaming application in mind. Don't worry, because the process is almost exactly the same for all of the streaming applications out there. So you can see the main camera is on a wide shot there, and that's because I wanted to show you exactly what was going on in this space, that I'm not switching anything out or using anything different. This is the real deal. You can also see that I have a different computer set up here. I'm not using the laptop. That's because I had to ship my laptop back to get something repaired on it, but the process is going to be the same on almost any computer that you use. So here's what we have going on. I have my streaming camera set up about six feet in front of me, and that's zoomed in so that it's kind of cropping just how I want to see it. You can see the HDMI cable coming out of the camera. That's coming over here. And on my table here, I have my microphone that I've attached back here just to create a little bit more room. Now, this is a little bit high kind of in the frame. I'd prefer it to be down lower, but unfortunately, in order to make that happen, I would have to mount that back about a foot and a half or figure out a way to actually mount this part of the arm lower. But this is fine for now. It's not actually hooked up right now. That's something that I'm going to show you how to do. Also on the table, I have this Behringer UMC204 HD. This is my USB audio interface. I have the microphone plugged in right here and I have the gain set. I have the drivers installed. The next thing I need to do is plug in the mage well and plug in the HDMI to that. Now I'm doing a screen recording on my computer here so you can see exactly what's going on. So I'm going to plug the USB 3.0 in and I'm also going to plug in the HDMI here. Now there's probably nothing that happened on the screen when I plugged in the USB 3.0 because I've already plugged that into this machine so it is installed already. But I'll just show you here if I go into the computer manager or device manager. This is under imaging devices. This is normally where you would find kind of webcam stuff and you can see it's listed right here. XI100D USB dash HDMI video. So that part of the equation is all set. Now there is software that you can download if you want to record on your computer. It's not the best software, but if you want to see if this is actually working before you try and stream anything, you could download Magewell software. It's called Capture Express. And when I open that up, you're going to see, hey, look at that. There it is. It's working. For whatever reason, the, uh, the aspect ratio is, is not quite right. I don't think there's a way to, to lock that. Um, but I can kind of stretch it out so that it looks okay. And uh, check that out. That is full screen right there. And I'm doing a screen recording, so you should be able to see that. And that looks pretty darn good. Much better than you would get on any webcam. You can use this just to make sure that the video is working. It's coming in great. I mean, you can see the motion here. Things are looking great. There's no dropped frames and there's no weird deinterlacing happening. So this looks pretty good. I'm just going to exit out of here. So I've already installed the drivers for this Behringer USB audio interface. There's really not a lot of settings in here. Some other audio interfaces will give you kind of levels and meters. This doesn't. But not to worry, we can use the streaming software to help us set the levels. I have turned up the gain a little bit so I can see that there's a signal light on here. And this does give me an indication if I crank this up, there's a red light on here that'll show me when it clips. So I do have that to, uh, to reference as well. So I'm going to show you how to get the video and the audio working in Google Hangouts. And the process is going to be exactly the same in almost every other streaming application out there. Every streaming application that I've used, they all work exactly the same. You select your video device, you select your audio device, and that's really pretty much it. So the reason why I'm not doing Hangouts on air is because I don't want to broadcast uh, me just kind of rambling on here to a bunch of people. So I'm just going to do a Google Hangouts with my wife, but it works exactly the same with Google Hangouts on air.
if I click my video button here, it turns on the camera and you can see that it's already working and it looks just fine. Under settings here, I can select the video source and right now there's only one, but if I had a webcam attached, you would see two. You would see the, the webcam and this XI100 USB, blah, blah, blah. So right now there's only one. Under the microphone input, I think I want to select this line uh, Behringer UMC 204. That is the device that I'm using. So I'm going to select that. And uh, two, one, you can see I'm getting good signal right in here. And then all I need to do is save. And so this is basically it. That's the entire process. Every one of these streaming applications is going to have a settings where you select your video input, you select your audio input. There's not much that you have to do other than that. Now, I believe that Google Hangouts is limited to maybe 720. And so the picture might not look as spectacular uh, scaled down to 720. So in terms of your overall quality, uh, that's not going to be limited by our setup here. Our setup is very high quality. The best that I can be is what I'm going to show you right here. That's this camera here. That's the recording on the camera. And that's kind of your best possible outcome. You're only going to be limited on the computer basically by your computer's processing speed. If you, for whatever reason, can't plug it into USB 3.0, if you plug it into USB 2.0, the resolution is going to scale down um, to something lower. It's not going to work really great. So as long as you're plugged into USB 3.0, you're going to be getting the full 1080 video stream, that's going to look fantastic. In terms of your broadcast resolution, that's really only going to be limited by the upload speed. So you're probably going to want to monitor the other devices on the network to make sure that they're not chewing up all of the bandwidth and hogging your connection so that it's reducing the quality of your video stream. But I'll show you another quick test that I'm going to do in Skype so you can see exactly what this looks like with a real video stream broadcasting over the internet. So check that out here. This is an example of what this streaming rig can do when it's actually doing a stream over the interwebs. I can see from my bandwidth monitor here that my connection up sending video from this computer here is not as good as it could be. I suspect that I'm being limited by some other traffic that's on the network here. Probably people just got home from work and they're doing a lot of uploading or downloading, and that's affecting the overall quality that I can get at this point in time. But I know that the camera is going to look good, the lighting looks good, the audio, hopefully that's sounding fantastic, and that's really all I can ask at this point, because what I need to do is work on my upload speed so I can get a better upload for video streaming. Make sure to check out the last lesson in this course, where you're going to hear some final tips and tricks to help you produce some great looking video streams. In this last lesson, I'm going to give you some final tips and tricks to help you produce some great looking and great sounding video streams. I have here a few more parts and pieces that I just wanted to show you that you might find helpful as you're setting up your video streaming rig, although none of this is essential. These are just kind of extras that you may want to check out. One of those is an HDMI splitter. Now, this can be very handy if you are setting your streaming camera a good distance away from you. Say you're setting it four, five, six, maybe eight feet away, that's totally fine and, and very doable, but you'll find that watching what you're doing on the camera's monitor is going to be tricky. So you may want to pick up an HDMI splitter, and these are fairly inexpensive. I think I bought this one for around $35, and it's an extra fancy one because it does 4K, which I don't need, but I figured that would cover me for any kind of future standards uh, that I might run into. So this is a fairly simple device. It is powered. It takes a little transformer, and there's one HDMI input and two HDMI outputs. And so I can bring the HDMI into this from the camera and then have one HDMI go to my Magewell capture device and have another HDMI go to an HDMI monitor that I can put somewhere to make sure that it's looking good and things are in focus and everything is the way that it's supposed to be. Now for that HDMI monitor, you can use, well, anything that has an HDMI input. You can use a TV, a computer monitor. I like using this small little monitor. This is a seven inch HDMI monitor. And this is handy because I can kind of stash it on a little magic arm somewhere, just out of the sight of the camera. 
and I can look to check my focus and, and make sure things are looking good there. So that's a handy tool to have as well, just a, an HDMI splitter and a secondary monitor. Again, it's not necessary, but it does help if you can't see your monitor because you have your camera set back a good ways. One other thing to note on this Magewell capture device is that it only comes with two parts. You have the capture dongle here, and then a rather short USB 3.0 cable. So this will work as long as you can get the capture device in the right spot, but you may need a longer USB 3.0 cable. If you are going to use this streaming rig with something like a laptop, you may not like the cables kind of sticking out of the side of the laptop. So another little accessory that I found very useful is this little 90 degree USB 3.0. It's probably an eight inch extension cable. So it plugs into the USB 3.0 and then from the computer, it plugs in and it's very low profile. So you don't have a cable that's sticking way out here. I'm kind of paranoid about these things. I don't like big cables sticking out the side of my computer because I think they just tend to get in the way. And also if I hit it with something, if I drop something on this connection while it's plugged in and it bends like this, that's gonna really kind of jack up that jack, so to speak. It may break the solder connections on the motherboard or the USB card. So I like to play it safe and use one of these little 90 degree adapters. Uh, I got a set of these on amazon.com and I think they were like $10 for two of them. And one of them was kind of a 90 degree and the other one was a 270 degree so that you could use it on the right and the left. And I think those are pretty handy to have. Now I didn't talk about specific HDMI cables in any of the lessons, but I did want to mention that if your camera does come with an HDMI cable, and this is an HDMI cable from a consumer video camera, they're going to be fairly short. So this is about six feet. And where I had the camera set up in the demo, that obviously wouldn't work because I had the camera about six feet away and then it's got to come out of the camera, go to the floor, come across the floor, up to the desk, across the desk and into the computer or kind of however you have it set up there. So you're probably going to need a little bit longer of a cable. And most of the consumer video cameras use this Type-C mini HDMI connector here. And this HDMI connector, and really all HDMI connectors, are not professional video connectors. Now, they can be used on professional gear, but they're not designed for the rigors of professional use where they're meant to be plugged in and unplugged 10,000 or 20,000 times. So they are quite delicate. Now, what I do to protect this tiny little, very fragile connection, I take a hook and loop strap here. This is a cable tie that I also use to wrap this up. But when I'm connecting this to my tripod, I make sure that there is a nice loop like this so that the HDMI connector is perpendicular to where it plugs into the camera and it's not being pulled like this or kind of pushed up like this. And then I take this hook and loop cable strap and I wrap it around something very tightly, uh, maybe a foot down from where it's plugged in. And that way, if the cable gets pulled, yanked or tripped on, it's not going to destroy that HDMI connection in your camera because once that's broken, you basically just have a fancy paperweight. I also like to wrap the power cable in the same way. I usually just wrap it right along the HDMI because that is also a very delicate connection. And if that gets yanked on or tripped on or pulled really hard, you can be pretty sure that that connection is going to be screwed up. And you really wanna have that camera plugged in and not running on battery power. So very simple to solve. Just take this little hook and loop or Velcro strap and very tightly wrap it around so that when you pull on it, it's not going to pull both of those connections. So that about wraps it up for this course. I hope you found this interesting, but more importantly, I hope you can take the skills and the ideas learned in this course and put them to use by producing some great looking and great sounding video streams. Thanks again for watching. My name is Dave Bodie for Tuts Plus, and I'll see you around.